Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the wonderful Elizabeth Yardley. We are talking about procrastination, what it is, why it might happen and what you can do about it. And in particular, thinking about the conversations that you might be having with your future self. So I do hope that this is useful and that you enjoy the episode. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello there. So lovely to have you here. Um, I've been I've been stalking you online and I um, <laughs> really love the work that you're doing. And thank you for saying yes to come and, and talk to us. No, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to it. I, know, I'm, I am very much looking forward to quizzing you, getting all the good stuff. So um, before we before we dive into stuff, though, I, I always ask about people's own journey. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your journey into the PhD and out the other side? Yeah, sure. So um, I did my undergraduate um, back in the the late 90s into the early 2000s at Aston University, and I studied politics and sociology. So I got really interested in, in the realms of social science and especially issues around stigma and marginalized groups and exclusion and all of those kind of things. And I got to the end of my undergraduate and I was like, I'm not done. (laughs) You know, I think there's still more that I want to know. Um, So I was very fortunate that the university I was studying at um, allowed you to apply for bursaries, fully funded bursaries, um, which was incredibly helpful. Um, So I applied for a bursary. I I was lucky in that I got it. And Mm -hmm. I started my PhD looking at teenage mothers and their experiences of, of stigma because at the time there was an awful lot of kind of chatter um about the teenage pregnancy rate being like massively high in the UK that we had the highest rates in Europe and it was terrible and all of this stuff and I thought I think there's another side to this story mm. and I want to kind of go and talk to people who experience teenage parenthood and you know find out from from their point of view what's it like for them you know mm. how are they coping with with all of this this quite damaging rhetoric that's happening at the policy level. And there was um, a big teenage pregnancy strategy that the government came out with at the time. And I was like, right, I think this is a sign (laughs) that Mm. I need to go and investigate this further. So it was a qualitative piece of research, um, largely interview based, um, semi-structured and often turned into unstructured (laughs) interviews. And it was a real voyage of discovery. Um, It was it was fantastic. So, yeah, that was that was my Ph.D. Uh, back in the day can't ask for more than a voyage of discovery can you yeah it was <laughs> it was fascinating and one of the things that that I discovered was was really like how not bothered most of my participants were by a lot of the the kind of messages that were were being portrayed about them at a kind of policy level and right. uh, and social stigma and all of that stuff because they were just too busy getting on with their lives and and for them it was having a, a child at a young age, it was it was normal. It was fine, you know, and, and they were like, I don't know what all the fuss is about. You know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> well, so it was it was great to get some insights into into their world. Amazing. Amazing. Um and so then out of the other side of that, where where did it take you next after your PhD? So when my PhD came to an end, um I did some work as a research assistant on kind of project to project to project, mm-hmm. um, which which felt quite sort of insecure. Um yes. I was in a position where I wanted to kind of buy my own flat and and mortgage lenders aren't very sort of sympathetic to that. Well, you had a job for three months, then you had a job for two months, then you had a job for seven months. <laughs> yes, yes, story. yes, yes, yes. So um yeah, I started looking outside of academia. Um so I, I actually worked as a, a consultant, essentially, a social research consultant um, in a private sector organization for a year and did a, a load of really kind of fascinating research there on all kinds of different projects. But the thing that I really kind of didn't like about that was you couldn't dive really deep into stuff. 
Right. Because the client wants an answer to this question. They're not interested in you going off and wandering around in the literature for six months. <laughs> right. No. right. They, they want an answer. They want a strategy. They want an outcome. Uh, so after a year, I was like, oh, God, I want to go back to academia. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, a job came up and I applied for it and, and I got it. So, yeah, the universe was aligned at that particular point in Amazing. time. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so this sense of um, working as a researcher and working in different types of research and different types of um, organisations and f- with different types of timescales, I'm imagining, I think that's an interesting point to start our discussion around procrastination, which is what we're here for today. (laughs) Absolutely. It gets us all, doesn't it? (laughs) It does. It really does. And I think that um, it's, it's, it sounds really simple, but actually it's quite a complex issue, isn't it? Um, Oh, it is. Yeah. It isn't just putting something off. Uh, The fact that you're putting something off is just a symptom of other stuff. And I think it doesn't help as well. A lot of the conversations that happen around procrastination, there's a lot of kind of guilt and shame attached to it. Yes. Um, and people often think, oh, I'm procrastinating, I'm so lazy, but it, it really isn't about laziness at all. No, it's it's you're in pain, isn't it? It's not laziness yeah. at all. Not laziness at all. So let's, let's um, so it, it's worth us then just acknowledging the difficulty of, of procrastination and like you say it gets us all it's not like Mm. anybody gets out unscathed and that but there may be kind of magnitudes and at different moments I don't know if that's been your experience in different moments and in different settings it may rear its head absolutely yeah it's not something that that will present in the same way every time you experience it no. And sometimes you might go months and months and you're just happily taking stuff off and you, you're kind of chugging along fine. And then all of a sudden, the smallest thing will become massive mm. um, and you will get really, really kind of bogged down by it um, because it tends to to become a bit of a vicious cycle. So you kind of procrastinate over the small thing and then the small thing turns into a bigger thing and then that becomes you know even more of an issue. Um, and it, it really can be quite paralyzing. Um, and, and like you say, it, it it affects everybody, you know, at all stages of their yes. academic career. I mean, there was yes. a task, there was this really tiny task that I had been procrastinating over for about two weeks. And I built it up into this, this huge thing. And, you know, every day when you, you've got something on your to-do list and you get to the end of the day and, oh, goodness me, it's still there. Oh, well, carry it over, carry it over. And this task, it ended up taking me like six minutes to do mm-hmm. yesterday. And I was like, Elizabeth, you are so ridiculous, you know. <laughs> but that's the thing, is it? That's the clue is that it's not actually the task. It's that kind of emotional aspect of it. And mm. I, th- I think that the other thing, like you say, in terms of the, the difference is that sometimes coming into the PhD, in fact, not sometimes, often coming into the PhD, people may not have experienced procrastination like they experience it during their PhD journey. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think no. stakes always feel so much higher when you get on to your doctoral journey, when you get onto a PhD program. Like yes. this is a big deal, you know? Yes. And yes. and there's a tendency sometimes to think that you should know it all, you know, that you should know how to do a literature review, that you should know how to write a methodology chapter. But the thing that I often say to people is, but you haven't done a literature review for this particular project before. No, <laughs> you haven't written no. the methods chapter for this particular thing. And you're also getting used to a, a new environment as well. And it's often an environment where you're surrounded by people that you respect and admire. So you tend to kind of put them on a bit of a pedestal and think that they've just got it all figured out. But trust me, they haven't. Yes. <laughs> they really yes. haven't. <laughs> and this is really important, isn't it? Because it, it can catch you unawares. And as you say, because the stakes feel very high, indeed you know are high you are you're you're a doctoral candidate um and the sense of the not knowing and the not knowing and the fear which can bring procrastination to play because you don't want to commit I don't want to put it on a piece of paper because I'm not sure about it therefore I won't put it on a piece of paper and I'll go and clean my cupboards out instead yeah totally (laughs) yeah I think fear is is really central to it Yes. And I think it's it's both a fear of a fear of failure, you know, yes. a, fear, a fear of criticism, 
but a fear yes. of success always comes into it as well yes, um yes. for the the students that i've supported over the years it's a phd is such a big deal because it, it can be life-changing and when you're on a phd program where you're somebody who's going to eventually be doctor whoever that then can tend to sort of upset some of your relationships and your kind of position in your social circle and the way that other people look at you and think of you and it it changes those particular dynamics and and sometimes that's that's quite a scary thing especially if you're from a background where you're the first person in your family to go to university or the first person in your friend group and this is just not something that people like me do that can be there in the background sometimes at a kind of subconscious level um and you're you're kind of like, you're kind of subconsciously sabotaging yourself with the procrastination and that can be what's underlying quite a lot of it absolutely so Take home message, everybody. You are not lazy. You are just petrified. There is lots Absolutely. going on. There is lots and lots going on. So I am sure there will be lots of people being able to relate to that and and kind of understand. If, hopefully the understanding of that will help to shift things a little bit in terms of like, I'm not lazy. I'm not a bad person. I'm just, you know, I need to support myself through this. But then the next question is, well, how do I support myself through this? And I know that you have some good strategies for that. So how, if you are caught up in a kind of procrastination vicious cycle how can you support yourself through it well I think first and foremost you've got to say to yourself this is okay it's it's fine that I'm going through this at the moment it's completely normal and mm. most PhD students experience this it's it's absolutely fine and I think the second thing is to try and get ahead of your future self a little little bit because I think the tendency when all of us procrastinate when we put things off when we say I'm not going to do this today I'm going to get onto it tomorrow is that we just assume that magically our future self our tomorrow self is going to be highly motivated to do this thing (laughs) (laughs) just overnight the fairies are going to come and sprinkle motivation dust on us and we're going to be well up for filling in our ethical approval application or clearing our email inbox (laughs) and that's just it's not going to happen unless Mm. you try and get ahead of yourself so Mm. you've got to anticipate the ways in which your future self is going to try and be a bit naughty and the way in which your future self is going to try and sabotage those plans so you might say, okay, I anticipate that my tomorrow self is going to say, I am way too busy to do this right now. I've had too many emails today. There are lots of people who are kind of in the office, lots of people asking for my help. So what you can do to get ahead of that is, well, you can set your email auto reply. You can put your auto response on and and say that you're not available today. And then that kind of manages other people's expectations about how available you are. You can go and work somewhere else, um, go and take yourself off to a coffee shop for the day or or a place that's quiet. And you can just do those kind of things to minimize the risk of those those interruptions and those, those things happening. Um, because our future self is is very naughty. <laughs> and and yeah. we've got to we've got to get into that headspace if well, we to and, and that again. And our future self is very smart, of course. This is the problem of being a smart person, Mm -hmm. is that you're very good at coming up with excuses and coming up with reasons that are very convincing. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I think the very nature of being a PhD student is that you have got a creative and a rebellious brain. And it just wants to do its own thing sometimes. And you have to rein it in and go, no, no, you can do that shiny thing later. But now you've got to focus on this other thing. You have to rein it in a bit. (laughs) I love it. And I love this sense of thinking about, okay, what might trip me up? Just being curious about yourself, isn't it? I'm like, okay, what might I say? And then I'm going to, I'm going to take that out. I'm going to, my auto response is on. I'm in the coffee shop. None of those things are going to apply. I then, I'm really setting myself up to be with that task. This is genius. There's no place to hide. (laughs) Uh, and then even kind of thinking what might happen when I'm in the coffee shop and I'm on my own am I going to reach my phone and start you know disappearing down an Instagram scroll hole so do I need to do something around that so there are various little apps that you can get for your phone in terms of um, making sure that you're productive and that you're not scrolling um, that kind of prevent you from going into it so it's it's worth just thinking about any of those kind of things that you might need as well yes Yes. And I think this sense of um, also what you said there in terms of the shiny thing, because there is going to be the thing that always feels more important than the thing you don't want to do. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> and I think this sense of rewards as well, isn't it? That and like you said, so you can do that tomorrow. You can do that when you finish. It's this your inner toddler. Yeah, <laughs> you can totally. have, You can have the chocolate buttons when you've finished your carrots. <laughs> Yeah, you got to eat your vegetables first. And this happens to me all of the time, the whole shiny object syndrome thing. And I think it really is part and parcel of the, the procrastination spiral. So mm. I've got like a shiny object syndrome notebook that I carry around with me. So if, if I put aside some time to work on something and I find myself going, oh, I want to do this other thing. What I'll do is I will write down that other thing in that notebook. If I've had a new idea for something, you know, an idea for a paper or a blog or whatever, I'll just spend five minutes writing down in this notebook just an outline for that and then I'll put it to the side and get back to what I was working on because I know it's safe in there I know it's not going to go anywhere because I think that's the fear is that when we have got these creative rebellious brains when ideas come into them we're like oh my god I need to grab that and I need to run with it right now yes. you don't need to do that you can just take a few minutes and make a note of it and go back to it later and it's safe in there you're not going to forget it it's not going to fly away and that then frees you up to go back to what it was you were doing. And that has been such a helpful thing for me. And I've recommended that to so many people. I love it. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And it can also be then a really productive state to be in because, as you say, as you sit down to do the other thing, so many other things come in and go, look at me, look at me. And so you're generating the next um, part of your project or, you know, like you say, the, the papers you might write. But you don't have to do them right then. You've got the ideas, but you don't have to actually get into them. Exactly. So say you've got a, a deadline to get 2,000 words of your literature review off to your supervisor by the end of the week. And you sat down and you, you're you working on that. And then, oh, I've had this idea for how I can make my recruitment poster better. That's great. OK, let's spend two minutes writing that down and then we'll go back to the literature review. Yes, <laughs> you yes, know, yes. And then you've got your reward because you can do your post that at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I know we're making it sound very simple. Um, and we both rec I know that you recognize, we recognize that it isn't, it isn't that simple, but actually this this is then dealing with the I think what I'm hearing you say is dealing with the kind of causes rather mm. than the symptom. Because I think often we just beat ourselves up and say, Oh, you're a bad person. Um but actually what you're saying is de thinking about, well, well, what's actually tripping me up? What's actually causing this? And I, I'll attend to that because that is time well spent. Exactly. Yeah. And it's putting these little strategies in place um, yes. because they will help you deal with it in the moment. And I think over the long term, you are able to then take a step back and look at the bigger picture and think, what are some of those factors in the background yes. that might have been leading me to engage in the procrastinating behavior um i think it just makes you much more self-aware yes absolutely absolutely and it isn't you know because you, you read this literature and it goes just push on through just do these things and it's like well we're not machines we yeah. are human beings and we are complex feeling beings and what i love about your approach is this sense of attending to yourself and what is going on for you so that actually, because no PhD student needs telling what they need to do. We we all know that. Yeah. But but there will be things that will trip us up. And it's not because we 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 um don't know what we're doing. It's just we we well, like we said, we're frightened with things that yeah. are going on. And I, I think that. being aware of our emotions and our emotional state is a massively important thing on the PhD yes. journey. Absolutely. Um, because burnout and overwhelm are again kind of part and parcel of this procrastination uh, cycle so if you're procrastinating and it keeps happening and you just cannot focus that could possibly be a sign that you're you're overwhelmed and you're at risk of heading for a burnout so it's perfectly fine for you to take a step back and just take some time out for a few days for a week because there is that tendency to kind of work and work and work and work and work because we're passionate about the things that we're researching. Yes. But like you said, we're not machines, we're not robots. We do need a bit of downtime. So often you know, pay attention to how regularly procrastination is cropping up for you because it could well signal that you just need a bit of a time out. Love that. And it's another that's another level of the curiosity, isn't it? Of like mm. rather than I'm so cross with myself, it's like, oh, I'm really interested in why I'm doing this. I'm really interested in why this is happening. And as you say, 
why this sense of attending to yourself as you would do to a friend of like, wow, it seems like things are really tough for you at the moment. I wonder what's going on rather than you wouldn't ever just shout at your friend, well, I think you should just get on with it. Exactly. Yeah. And we are so much harsher <laughs> critics of ourselves. We would never speak to like a fellow PhD student mm. or a friend in the way that we speak to ourselves. Mm. So having some compassion for yourself is is really important. Mm. And then just ask yourself every day, okay, what's on your mind today? What are you mm. worried about today? Anything mm. concerning you today? You almost have to become your own kind of therapist <laughs> in a way. Totally, totally. And because that's the way that works, shouting at yourself is not, it's only going to make yourself more upset mm. and actually attending to yourself and the strategies that you're suggesting, those kinds of strategies, those are the things that move you forward. Those little um, wins that you have and the way forward. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And I um, think with the PhD journey as well, often, like we're just so focused on the outcome of finishing the damn thing. Yes. And we often don't take the time to celebrate the small steps that we make along the way. Yes. So we finish transcribing that really tough interview. Well, that's a win. Celebrate that. Yes. You filled in your ethical application form. That's the win. Celebrate that. Yes. So, you know, make make sure that you do take the time to acknowledge the little steps that you make because they're all part of the journey. Absolutely. And and it's really motivating too, because I think often, as you say, procrastination can be part of overwhelm. It's just like, I don't know where to start. I don't know if I'm any good at this. Can I do this? I don't know. Whereas if you are celebrating along the way and go, look at me, I've done that. I've done that. Not in an yeah. arrogant way, but just recognizing I have done this. I can do that. It can, it can really help to assuage the sense of overwhelm and insecurity, which, which sits with us most of the time doesn't it really when I say us I mean me <laughs> <laughs> oh me too absolutely and I think that's a really important thing to say isn't it that, that procrastination overwhelm perfectionism all of these things that they never really go away no. you just get much better at dealing with them and recognizing them for what they are and having some compassion for yourself and realizing that you're human I and understand. just having these small strategies in place to go right hello procrastination I see you, yes, <laughs> you know, it's funny yes. that you should show up right now and just kind of having those kind of conversations with yourself about it. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay. So we could talk for much longer. I, I <laughs> could feel that brewing, but I have to oh, be yeah. aware of time. <laughs> um, and there's a lot that we've covered in there. Um, and I always ask people very unfairly at the end of end of the interview to to give some top tips. But I wonder if there's anything that you would kind of draw out as, as a top tip or indeed new information as a top tip to finish with. Um, I think I think the thing that I'd really like to share as a top tip is just to remember that done is always better than perfect. So you're procrastinating over something. It's annoying you. It's getting on your nerves. How about you just spend 10 minutes on it? just get it to a particular stage, just just get half a page written or get an email drafted, just do a little bit of it. You don't have to do the whole task, just get started on it and then go and do something else. And often when you just you just get on with a little part of it, okay, rather than doing the whole ethics form today, I'm just going to read through the guidance about it or I'm going to email my supervisor and arrange to have a chat with them about it. You've done part of it, you're part of the way there. So just doing something you don't have to get it finished and get it perfect you just need to get it off the ground oh, and I think that's, that's always something that has kind of stuck with me and that's something my PhD supervisor said to me back in the day <laughs> this is brilliant this is brilliant because it deals with so many of the things you were touching on this sense of overwhelm it doesn't need to be overwhelming all I'm going to do is read through the guidance that's all I'm going to do and that will get you to your desk isn't it if that's all I've got to do read through the guide. right okay I can do that look I've done it hooray <laughs> exactly and, and, and make it enjoyable for yourself though yes. have a nice cup of coffee have a biscuit while you're doing it you know <laughs> that often takes the edge off of some of these, <laughs> these tasks if you can make it enjoyable you know put a nice scented candle in the background you know make sure that you you're in a place where you feel comfortable um listen to some white noise you know that's a big one for me I love a bit of white noise so just do what what is going to be helpful for you to get you to that starting line I love that so much. Um, thank you very much. I know there will be lots of people who are listening who are 
in that procrastination moment. And there's so much in there to try to experiment with and to just become more aware of yourself. And thank you for reminding us of that, of this kind of conversation that we're having with ourselves um, and to give ourselves a biscuit. That's my take home. Yeah. And just remember, if you weren't capable of it, you wouldn't be here. You've already got so much success behind you. So all good. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Oh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time. We will have all your, because you do amazing work. And I I particularly have been stalking you on Instagram. And so people (laughs) might want to check you out. We'll have all your details um, in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. It's been fantastic. And thank you all for listening. 